I've got the great pleasure today to have Andrew Doyle with me on the Ralston College podcast. Andrew Doyle is a satirist, a writer, and a doctor of <laughs> Renaissance English poetry. Thank you, yeah, Andrew, not, so much for not joining me. Not, not, to, not a proper doctor. I can't heal you. you, you know. If you well, well, you know, doctor in the you know in the sense of a teacher, Doctor Andrew sure. Doyle, we could say. Um, sure. Anyway, welcome, Andrew, to the Royal Scholars Podcast. Uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I alluded to your background in Renaissance poetry. Could you just sketch out for us a little bit of your academic or educational background, and we can sort of go from there into various other questions? Yes. I, well, I was all set to, to be an academic. I was sort of going that in that direction. Um, I was a... I, I, completed my doctorate at Oxford University. Um, and at the time I was also a part-time lecturer at the university. Um, and in, and my, my, my field was, uh, Renaissance poetry, specifically on my doctorate was about Renaissance poetry. So I taught the undergraduates, the Shakespeare module at, at the college, Wadham college at Oxford. Um, and I also taught modules on, I think, uh, tragedy and, um, it's going back a bit now. Um, um, and theatre, modern British theatre, I think. So, um, uh, so I was all set to do that. And then, um, and my, my background academically had been that I'd done my undergraduate degree at Aberystwyth University. And then I wanted to do a master's degree, uh, but specialising in Renaissance literature. And, uh, the, and I really wanted to stay at Aberystwyth, to be honest. I love the place, but they didn't offer that course. So I went to York and I was able to do that because I had a scholarship from York. Um, and then I was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Board to to write the um, uh, doctoral thesis at Oxford. Um, and that was good for me because I wanted to focus on uh, um, manuscript work, a lot of manuscript work. So the, the Bodleian Library is by far the best place in the world for early modern manuscripts. So, uh, so that all worked out really well. One of the first things I did when I got to Oxford was learn how to read the handwriting, 16th century handwriting. Um, and that was great. So that so that was my trajectory. But then I started feeling disillusioned with academia at Oxford. And I and I felt that I didn't want to do that as a career. Actually, one of my supervisors explicitly warned me not to do it. He said, you'll run around, you'll be, end up an elderly man running around the quad screaming, why have I wasted my life? That was his view on these things. So, um, I, and I, I thought that was a bit alarmist, but I, I, but it did tap into something that actually I wanted to be doing other things that were maybe a bit more creative rather than just writing about other people's work you know a bit like the professor in Uncle Vanya you know this idea of I want to I want to go and do some stuff for myself so I, I moved to London and I, and I started putting on plays and writing comedy things mostly um uh and je and gradually sort of drifted away from academia that way but I ended up teaching at a secondary school because I'd run out of money and I I, I wasn't qualified to do anything else so I ended up as a, as a secondary school teacher for a number of years as well um before I was earning enough money from comedy and and performance to give that up. So that's that's sort of my sort of vague background, I guess. Before we started uh, rolling the interview, we were talking a bit about the idea that language is uh, all there is, that uh, language is power and all there is is language, no realities beyond that. Um, can you give us a sense of, of how you encountered that view in your doctoral studies? Uh, and then we can, you know, sort of trace its its uh, trace the widespread and influential character of that idea in other ways. Well, I'd encounter that in my undergraduate studies. I mean, this was so built into academia of that era, of the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. It was so kind of built in. Uh, it was largely being promoted, particularly in English literature, you know, it was largely being promoted by over here, the cultural materialists over in America, the new historicists. So, um, w you know, in order to pass a degree uh, in English literature, you would need to understand and grapple with um, theory and, and, and particularly uh, postmodern theory and post-structuralist theory. Foucault, uh, Derrida, uh, these are the people who, who um, popularized this idea of uh, that there is no reality beyond the language we choose to express our world. And, that, you know, and this, this notion was so sort of built in, it was almost a kind of dogma. So you'd, so you'd end up just, it wasn't even really up for discussion. You know, I remember going to conferences and things and people would just cite Foucault um, uncritically as though he was, um, I mean, I mentioned to you before we started recording, there's a book, Saint Foucault, 
by David Halperin, which is un, un, unashamedly, I mean, it describes itself as a, as a hagiography. It's unashamedly worshipping him uh, as this kind of deity figure. And that, of course, is not, is not healthy. Um, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff that Foucault did, but there's also a lot of, um, of stuff that doesn't interest me and I, or a lot of flawed premises. Um, so I think uh, it was already built into to academia at that, at that point. And I think what's happened now is what we're seeing is that stuff, this sort of stuff is a bit outdated, I'd say, but, but it's filtering into the mainstream now. I think that's what's happened. That's why when you hear people talk about speech being a form of violence, um, you, you hear this very sort of sensorial uh, attempt to control the way people speak because they believe that if certain speech is normalized, that's the word they use, normalized or legitimized, uh, then the world changes. People's ideas change because, because language constructs absolutely everything. That idea is a, a, essentially an old post-structuralist idea. It's a, it's, it, it, it comes from there. It's just migrated into the mainstream somehow. That's the thing that I think we need to grapple with. And a lot of the people who, who do buy into this faith-based position um, that language constructs reality, and not only that, that, um, that um, um, I suppose, uh, that we need to control certain forms of speech. We need to control it for the sake of social justice. This, this, all of this idea come, has these origins in academia, even though many of the people uh, perpetuating it don't know about those origins. They don't read... Uh, Foucault or Derrida or anything like that. They don't. They don't go back to the source material. They've just sort of imbibed uh, the essential ideas somehow. Um, so I think that's what we need to. I think that's why understanding where it's come from is is, is important in terms of um, tackling it now. Yeah, let's let's dig in a little bit further into the the fundamental character of this worldview. Uh, mm. The I, I think it maybe even goes back further in terms of its first articulation, maybe into the mid 19th century, into Marx and Feuerbach and other figures of that sort. I mean, when you think when when Marx says man makes religion, religion does not make man, and other things of that sort, the driving idea seems to be that the there is no realm independent of what we ourselves are creating so it's a yes. fundamentally constructivist standpoint well no this is why it's been so readily adapted by the it was so readily adapted by the post structuralists that's exactly why it, because it lends itself to that esoteric worldview that almost religious worldview you know there's a really good reason why there's a, a whole chapter in joseph schumpeter's book um what's it called capitalism socialism and democracies uh, a, a sort of standard book in economic theory, there's a chapter on Marx as a religious figure, and it makes complete sense. And when and when 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 Derrida got hold of it, I mean, what what, what the French post structuralists of the 1960s were doing is they were substituting um, money, the economy, for uh, identity and and power structures, right? So so it's a template that they used, and and even the word Marxist was used, co opted. Um, and that's why you get all these arguments now about, well, are we dealing with cultural Marxism? And then genuine Marxists would say that this has nothing to do with Marxism. Um, but it's a, but it's a, it's a, it's a fair point that, 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 that the, uh, the, the originators of this very idea were openly co-opting Marx. So it, it just, you're right. I mean, this stuff does go back a long, long time, but I think those are the key, I think the key turning points are firstly when uh, the, the, the French theorists adapted Marxian ideas for, the, for their own purposes and develop these, this emphasis on language and power, uh, power knowledge, as Foucault had it. Um, and then you get that other turning point, which I know James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose talk about in their new book, Cynical Theories, the applied postmodernism, where you, know, you had the theory, but then you had a, gener a new generation of activists in the 1990s who wanted to apply the theory to society and change society. So whereas you can go, you, you know, you can, the old postmodernists were not activists in the way that the current crop are. And that, I think, is the major turning point, because now what we have is policy decisions in the government, in the arts, in education, in higher education, but also in, in schools, um, in HR departments, across the managerial classes. And all of these things are being informed by postmodern ideas, untested and unproven and largely outdated. Uh, but they're being treated as truth rather than contested theories and applied to policy, hence hate speech laws. 
because then you know they they are saying that if or the idea that if we don't control certain adverts, I and mean, we've got the advertising standards authority banning certain adverts if they perpetuate stereotypes. You've got the mayor of London taking down adverts from the tube if they perpetuate certain stereotypes about women. Uh, because there is a belief that if you put this mass media stuff out there, the country changes, the minds of the plebeians are are, are corrupted, which is, uh, of course, the exact worldview that the old, um, uh, like Mary Whitehouse and the old sort of um, theocrats had. Um, but that idea, media affects theory, taken as gospel, right? Even though it's been debunked, even though, you know, six decades of research into media affects theory show that it doesn't isn't real, that there isn't this correlation between uh, mass media consumption and and the way the public behaves. So we know that's not the, and the, direct, the, the, the direct effects model has been completely debunked, but that doesn't matter because this is like I say, a kind of faith uh, religion idea that is now being applied as truth. That's the problem. It isn't that we can't have a discussion about things like systemic racism and you know structural inequalities and all of that sort of stuff. These are legitimate and valid discussions to be had. The problem is that it is asserted as though it is truth. So the evidence lies in the assertion. So you can say, you say Britain is a fundamentally structurally racist and white supremacist culture and you go from there. Well, no, that's not a starting point. That's a conclusion that you may or may not reach after much discussion and evidence-based thought. That's not happening. The skipping over the discussion bit and taking a faith-based position as the conclusion, that's, that's, that's the problem that I see happening. And I do see all of that coming from uh, the, the problems in academia. That's why I think fixing the humanities and the social sciences is probably the priority. Although now I note it's infecting other areas, of course, as well, like mathematics and science and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's no question that this is a worldview that is uh, uh, propagated by and through, above all, the university system. Yeah. And it, it, it goes from there into any and all other forms of culture because it's upstream of all those other forms of influence. So you deconstruct the idea of beauty in a philosophical way that ends up architecturally being expressed in brutalism and in forms of visual culture that deny explicitly that there is any objectivity to harmony or proportion or any of these kinds of things and wish to insist that we confront directly the absence of those realities by building ugly things. And so in that sense, I mean, architecture is actually one of the most, one of the clearest forms of sure. the ideological standpoint, because we, we, we have to look at this stuff every day. Mm -hmm. Let me p tease out a few uh, things, what you've said. The f first is that I think the activism is baked into the constructivist standpoint, because insofar as you think, you know, reality is just a construct. Well, it's just a matter of having enough power to change what's real, right? I mean, it, that's, it just, that's a perfectly logical move to make. Um, the second thing is that when one often hears this invocation of, of a religious standpoint, and I want to tease that out and also maybe push back on it a little bit because really the work that religion is doing in that sentence is a stand-in for an un- critically accepted uh, axiom, something that's taken sure. you know, on faith, so to speak. But, you know, we also uh, know that r religion can have a rational content. And, you know, in, in fact, that is in, 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 certainly in the Western tradition that I know, I mean, the, the uh, going right back to the Greeks and, you know, Socrates' relation to the oracle, there is a discursive character to Greek religion that is taken up through certainly Christianity and Judaism at certain uh, periods, certainly in uh, in the other religion, religions of the book, Islam, for example. So what I'm trying to get at is that their religion can be something that is simply uh, non-rationally uh, uh, believed without any discursive or conscious grasp of the content, whether it's true or false or whatever. But mm -hmm. that's not true of all religion all the time. No, I call the social justice a religion largely as a rhetorical device, okay? Because, because I think in order to tackle it, it has to be accessible and understandable. And I think that's a, a good way, a good way that, that most people will just immediately understand is, is that the, the fundamental principle being um, uh, a group of powerful individuals who are not the majority, but they are the powerful elite, uh, are expecting you to accept things that are true that are not true and expecting you to articulate the idea that these things are true uh, without evidence. 
And that's something that you can broadly uh, uh, apply to the history of, of the Abrahamic religions. I think that's a fair point. I mean, you can, I'm not trying to suggest that, that uh, major religious practices are devoid of rationality or thought, but there are um, quite obvious examples where uh, rationality is a hindrance. I mean, if you take, for instance, and, and more, moreover, the expression of a faith-based position is express, expressed through rational terms. So to give an example, so let's take transubstantiation. Now, the, the way that this is explained, that the, the, the bread that you see before you has literally become the flesh of Christ, right? Not figuratively, not symbolically. It is literally the flesh of Christ, but it still looks like bread and it still tastes like bread and it has the quality of bread. Now, in order to justify this, uh, you get this concept of transubstantiation, which is drawing from an Aristotelian principle, the idea of, of, of that everything has substance and accidents, you know? And, and what has happened here is that the substance of the bread has changed, but the accidents its breadness remains uh, the same. Okay, now that's quite a convoluted way to 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 expect people to accept what is effectively a magic trick, ex except that this has taken place, and it's dressed up in in such sort of difficult terms and 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 esoteric terms that it's likely to evade a challenge from most people. Now th this is this is something I think is very important about the current postmodernist social justice movement is that the jargon is deliberate the 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 use of of terminology that is not understood the fact that when they talk about anti-racism they don't mean what everyone else means by the phrase anti-racism everyone else means to be opposed to racism they don't mean that okay they mean something very much more specific uh which is about a recognition of the no, uh, the notion of, of white privilege uh, the notion of systemic racism and that and that if you are not being actively opposed to that original premise that you may or may not agree with, then you are not being anti-racist. So, so it's things like that. The, partly they play on the ambiguity. They play on people's good nature uh, be, because who wouldn't want to be anti-racist, right? Um, but it's also designed to dress up something that's pretty flimsy. I mean, if you, if you re and this has always been the case. I remember reading Judith Butler's book, Gender Trouble, back in the 90s, you know, this sort of seminal work of queer theory, you could pretty much summarize what she's saying in a blurb, in a paragraph, if you want, if you chose to. She just has an incredible way of, of going on for 200 pages uh, and dressing everything up in the most convoluted uh, obscurantist language uh, and, and, and saying very little, frankly. So that's what I mean about the religious com uh, comparison. Uh, I mean, you, you know, it, if you if you tell the congregation that the, the bread has turned to flesh, actual flesh, uh, and they question that, then you can throw this this uh, philosophical philosophical concept of transubstantiation at them, and it's going to stop them. It's going to stop them from broaching it. They say, "Okay, I don't understand this, but there's a, re a reason behind it. The big words tell me so," and then move on. So it's a for it's a way of exercising control. I mean, one could have a long talk about the ways in which religion perversely uses philosophical standpoints. Uh, in order to, you know, pull the wool over the eyes in the way that you're s suggesting. I'm not a scholar of 16th century, 17th century theology, but there's certainly, in, say, Richard Hooker's account of what's going on in the sacraments, there's a much richer account of that than comes to be portrayed subsequently. But my fundamental point, actually, is that in the Greco-Christian uh, standpoint that develops in the West, what really is going on is the claim that truth is sovereign. And so there is no claim that cannot be in spite. I mean, you know, Aquinas was, 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 was if he had lived longer, would probably have, have been excommunicated for holding to the high view of, of rationality that he, mm. that, he, that he advocated. The whole Greek philosophical tradition emerges out of a, philos it is a philosophical reflection on the poetic uh, standpoint, you know, presented Homer and, and the and 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 the other poets, and so it's a, it's a, it's not that the poets don't have anything true to say. It's that it's held in a poetic or intuitive mode, which then philosophy comes along to say, well, here's what actually are the, here's what the philosophical or universal truths present in that are. I think it's it's important to take these questions of religion outside of the context of the religions that are currently still practiced, you know, like whether it's Christianity, Judaism, or Islam, because the various 
dogmatisms and absurdities and irrational modes of behavior by certain adherents to those religions can, uh, let's say, blind us to investigate the dynamic between, say, myth and philosophy, or you know, muthos and, and, and logos, uh, that are, is otherwise present in the history. And so the, the point I'm looking to make is a simple one, and that is that, but a deep one, and that is that myth, which is often the mode that religion can take, there can be true myths or myths that have truth in them. But those truths need to be articulated by and grasped rationally. You don't just say, oh, well, because Zeus says so, that's, therefore right. we should do, do whatever. You say, well, wait, no, we can give a rational account of what is happening in the myth, and that's how we know it's true. Not because sure. we've received it simply as a myth, but because now we see that the story is giving rise to a deeper reality or helping us grasp a deeper reality. But I think that the, the, the point that I'm looking to make here is that that very process is the one that's denied when you deny any kind of sovereignty to truth or rationality itself. When you right. jettison that principle, all you're left with in the end is power and the coercions that power can wreak in the world because you have denied that our thinking has any purchase on reality. In fact, reality has no reality, so there's nothing there even to know. I think you're absolutely right, and I'm not, I think it's worth emphasizing that the comparison with religion is not an attack on religion, right? The attack of the, 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 the comparison with the social justice movement, it's not, it is, it is, like I say, a rhetorical device to explain that, you know, it is the broad, the broad brushstrokes, the, the basic things like being told to express something that you know not to be true, the, the fact that they seek to excommunicate people who don't agree, they seek out heretics, all of these sort of qualities that you would associate with a kind of caricatured vision of what religion is, but nonetheless, it is an effective way to, to, to explain those, those basic ideas. Uh, I'm completely on board with what you're saying about the embedded truths in myths and the way that, say, you know, you can look at the the two creation narratives in, in Genesis and you could say, you could, you could even debunk them on the basis that there are two contradictory narratives in the same book. Um, but that's not the point, is it? The, the point isn't the, the authentic uh, historical matter. The point is the, the truths that they uh, point to, right? And, and so, I, I, which are reached from a perspective of rationality. So I completely, I can, I'm completely on board with that. And I suppose I, I do need to make clear, I mean, I'm writing a book at the moment about this where I will be using this religion metaphor a great deal. I need to make clear in that book what I'm doing there, that it is not an attack <laughs> on just religion per se. That's not, in fact, it's not at all. Um, it's an yeah. analogy. I'm a, yeah, I, I, I completely get what you're saying and I, and, I, and I think I fundamentally agree. What I bristle with a bit is when people wish to use as a synonym hmm. for, used to use, use, like to use, wish to use religion as a, as a blanket synonym for uh, irrational beliefs. And oh, that's, okay. that's, 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 that's just not fair either to the history of religion or of philosophy. It, it, it can be the way in which certain people take up religious beliefs, but that can be the way people take up scientific beliefs. It can be the way people take up any, any number of beliefs can be taken sure. up in, in an unreconstructed and, and irrational way. Whether those beliefs are true or not is, is sometimes irrelevant to, when the view is taken up without regard for its truth, you have no idea whether it's true. Well, I think that's the more important point about this isn't it that that the it's the attack on the notion of truth itself that is the real problem that's why we've seen in just in the last week all of this incredible these debates on twitter about two how two plus two can equal five you know and th and that, that you know this is not about uh i mean you know th and this is coming from um, major mathematicians at uh, major academic university uh, institutions right so it's not really about the, the technicalities of advanced math, mathematics. That's not, or that's not what this is. What this is is an ideologically informed thing which attempts to undermine uh, the, the, the truths that we, we, we rely on in order to exist, actually. Uh, it's part of a broader project. Um, so, yeah, I think, that is, I think that is a problem. I think teaching people or telling people to be mistrustful of the idea of truth gets us absolutely nowhere.
you know? It, it, it's, 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 it, I think you're completely right. This, this is really bedrock, right? I mean, it's, that's why I think that th this is a worldview that of which the most fundamental pillar is that there is no truth or that tr sure. reality is fundamentally a construct. Because well, everything not just that, but that truth is that the truth that we have arrived at is a form of oppression. It, it, it is there solely to uh, perpetuate power structures based on race, gender, sexuality, etc. Well, it has to be because it has to be if there is no underlying structure to reality, right? Because if everything is simply a construct, then the things we have received were simply constructions of the will to power of others. Right. And that's why we should essentially weaponize all there ever is, is the war of all, one will to power against another. That's what that's, that's fundamentally what the view, what the right. view is. Whereas to believe in truth, however hard it is to get to, however complex, however elusive, however uh, much it, 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 it escapes us at times to believe in it is to think that there is a structure to reality which our thinking has purchase on. And I suppose you can rationalize yourself to that conclusion. But my, my point is that the, within that, there is something uh, that is ultimately being taken on belief at the heart of it. That, you know, and well, more than that, it's, it's, it's many, many years of people not just expressing uh, similar views, but, but citing each other's views. And then, and then they've built up this kind of illusion that this is a real thing, you know? And that's, yeah, and I that think I, I think I actually I should correct. I said you know to believe in truth, uh, that that is already, in a certain sense, to misspeak, because truth is precisely that which does not need to be taken simply on the basis of belief, but which can be known discursively, rationally in its universality, and mm -hmm. so truth is precisely that which has an inner illuminating logic that can be grasped and understood. Right. right. And trying to uh, erase that from civilization is such a self-defeating process. I mean, I can't tell you where, where, where this will go, uh, but it is a form of intellectual anarchy. Uh, it, it means that as a society, we are utterly, uh, we have nothing left. And, and the, 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 I don't think the dangers of that can be overstated. Um, and I don't know how you fight back against that, but I think one of the ways that you do that is, is like I say, tracing the origin of this stuff and, and, and helping people to understand where it's come from and why it exists and why, moreover, it has so much power. How much, why, where did it acquire such cultural clout, you know? I mean, when a lot of these people were saying these things back when I was at university, I mean, there was no sense in which this would suddenly become... Uh, the backbone of educational policy in the national curriculum. <laughs> there was no sense in which that could possibly happen. So what's really interesting to me is the, is the way in which fringe ideas from a, a, a group of academics have now got to the point uh, where, where they're pulling the strings of society, where they are the, the, the puppet masters. And, and I think, and this, this incredible consensus within higher education now, I mean, I've noticed this recently that when I've seen um, uh, pylons on, on Twitter, particularly, uh, which are emphasizing this idea of um, Western civilization as a structurally racist uh, concept, it's always, it's blue checked academics who are piling in and, 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 and trying to bully others and berate others with their superior knowledge, referencing their own PhDs, referencing their own reading, saying, you don't know enough to understand this. And that to me sounds a lot like uh, the priests <laughs> who, who are t telling the congregation, we know, we can, this is a good reason why uh, the Bible was kept out of the vernacular for so long, because they didn't want the masses reading the text for themselves and, and, and reaching their own judgments. It's, a, it's the same thing. I'm sorry to go back to the religion thing. I know it's something that... No, I mean, I, 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 think, I, think it, I think that works both ways. I mean, there's, there's, there's no question that there's also a connection between the translation of the Bible into the vernacular and yeah. modern freedoms as they develop throughout Europe. That is yeah. to say, the, the very conception that the individual as, you know, the, the, that the individual, I mean, what does it mean for the individual to be, as there's a phrase in French, the face en face, that, you know, face to face with God, 
That's mm-hmm. what is going on in the translation of the scriptures into the into the vernacular. And yeah. something, you might say, that is the uh, spiritual metaphysical presumption of all of m- modern democratic freedom. That is to say that the individual in its own in in its own internal subjectivity has a relation to what is most real and you know we can trans take this completely out of the the religious context i'm simply trying to suggest that what's moving in that uh fundamental claim is is the underlying uh belief or presumption of all of modern subjectivity right and it, of course, that subjectivity has its has its, has its whole lo- long evolution, in, at least in the West, you know, going back to the Greeks through the Middle Ages, and we, we, that's, these are complicated matters that one could, you know, that the whole history is 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 made up of. But the the point is that our fundamental view about ourselves is that we have some relation to what's real that we ourselves can understand, right. and that it seems to me is what is denied that's right essentially in the nihilism that is currently dominant there and is where, no knowable reality and you have no relation to whatever there is out there other right. other than what we will tell you your relation can be and that's where the religion analogy breaks down because actually it's that that absence at the heart of this of this movement of this ideology uh, is is precisely what is so horrifying about it so, yeah, I, I, I completely accept what you're saying here, but the, the question becomes, I mean, just moving beyond what, what analogies we, we favor uh, to describe this. Um, and bear in mind, by the way, that a lot of the time when I talk about critical race theory, for instance, even, even, even using a phrase like that, I will get people contacting me saying, don't use phrases like that. I don't know what you mean when you say phrases like that. So, so in, a, in a sense, you do have to find an accessible way uh, particularly when so much is at stake. Um, well, this, but, this is part of this. Just makes me. This just makes me. Uh, it throws me into a, a, a almost a rage because the notion that the basic realities of human life should not yeah. be able to be understood by you know the average human being. I mean that is a reprehensible notion that also, yes. frankly, runs against you know everything we know about a human being's ability to, you know, run her or his life. And, and so, yeah. and this is right, right at the heart of the, the, the corruption in the academy. I mean, the notion that, that work in the human, I listen, there's a big difference between the science and the humanities insofar as if you're a specialist in particle physics or, you know, the, 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 any other of the, the many subspecialties of uh, the sciences, it is true that, you might be able to give a bit of an explanation of basically the field that you're working on, but you're not mm-hmm. going to be able to understand the scholarship written in those fields if you do not have a very serious background in those fields, which oh. you could t- could take many, many years to acquire and also particular intellectual abilities that not, are, that not everyone has. So I understand that the papers written about particle physics are not things that me that I Stephen Blackwood should be able to understand because I don't have the background in physics. Sure. That is not true for the humanities in the main. You can look at the 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 most wonderful texts of the whole history of art history, or of uh, uh, architecture, or of history, or of any of the other humanistic disciplines. Philosophy possibly accepted for reasons we could go into. But fundamentally, those things can be written about in a way that anyone who is literate can understand. Yes. And that corruption is, is, has consequences so vast that we can hardly imagine them, and we couldn't imagine them if it were not for the fact that we're actually living in them in the deconstruction of our culture all around us. I, I, think, I think the rage that you are experiencing is, is completely right. I mean, what, what you've got to remember is that there isn't compassion and empathy at the heart of this movement. This, this is a movement that is, works under the banner of social justice. It's not interested in, 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 in actually advancing social justice. It is not a compassionate, it, it is something that will leave people feeling totally without purpose and meaning and completely soulless. That's what, that's, that's what it does. So I, I, can, I completely understand. And, and it's also why you get this incredible 
what you're describing there, I suppose, we might call an attack on on history. And this is something I, I detected very early on, even when I was an undergraduate. And, you know, you'd, the, 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 the books that they were citing and the articles that they were citing had, had all this shared worldview where anything that was written before the 80s, anything that they dismissed as liberal humanism or biological essentialism or whatever, and they just, and they just wrote off centuries of scholarship you know they just wrote it all off as being you know now we've come along uh, and we're all going to be quoting each other and giving this 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 illusion of incontrovertibility because we 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 all have the same ideas about the world and we're all advancing the same position and we can completely claim that we are not building upon uh, and we have not inherited the knowledge of our forebears that's that's a, an absolute absolutely disastrous perspective to hold and this is i think a, a misunderstanding and there's a real mistrust, isn't there, about about conservatism and about the idea of of um, not wanting things to change. And that's not really what a culturally conservative person is saying. They're saying that thing we do adapt and we do, but we build upon uh, the knowledge that we've inherited from the past, and we have to do that. Um, and so that hence all this attack on pulling down statues or uh, decolonizing curricula and removing certain texts that might be deemed offensive by the standards of yesteryear. Okay, so. All of that stuff is going on, um, but I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding. And I think uh, I would consider myself, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say politically, certainly not economically that I'm on the right, but I, I share with George Orwell uh, a very deep uh, cultural conservatism, I think. I think it's important and essential uh, to, to draw upon uh, past knowledge. Well, well I think, yeah, I think that you're, you're completely right. And the fundamentally what the small c conservative view of tradition is supposed to be rightly understood is that we have received things that we may not completely understand. We don't perpetuate them simply because they're from the past. We must first come to understand them so we can think through, well, how does this relate to us today? And what is, what is the wisdom in this? Uh, and how should we perhaps change these things to be more adequate to our understanding, a fuller understanding of what we are? So it's very much the relation between the, the, the myth and uh, reason dialectic that we were talking about earlier, that these are received and perhaps not understood, but we shouldn't keep them just because they're from the past. It may be that there, and there are all kinds of perversities in the way things have been done in the past and so on and so forth. But just because we don't understand them doesn't mean there isn't deep truth in them that we would neglect at our peril. And so yeah. the notion that somehow tradition is opposed to rationality is precisely the kind of false opposition that leads to throwing out the very inherited wisdom that would allow us to live more richly than we can through our own impoverished existential immediacy. Right. right. I mean, the, the, the idea that the Parthenon has an inherent beauty has not come about because of a conspiracy of, of dead white men who wish to, to oppress other cultures. It's something that there, there is a, a a truth to that that we would do well to reckon with through through uh, you know reading through uh, through our experiences of art uh, through understanding all of this stuff. That if you just if you just boil it, it's so reductive. Like if you just boil it down to power. If power, I mean, look, I'm not saying that power isn't important. There are power relations in every conversation, right? But it's not everything. It doesn't control absolutely everything. It doesn't determine everything. And certainly not in the case of art, I don't think. Well, well, I think no, no one who knows anything about anything thinks that power isn't, that isn't real or can't be manipulated right, or can't right. be used to destructive and terrible ends. What is fundamentally at work here, though, is whether truth is subject to power. Right. And, and, and that's the worldview that I think, well, not only do I reject, I think it can be shown to be untrue. Right. Truth is not subject to power. I think this sense of how criticism works and that criticism has to be motivated or true criticism is based in an ideal according to which the criticism is able to criticize something that's right. falling short of an ideal, that, that dynamic is precisely the one that is denied by those who would deny truth. So, I mean, it's often pointed out that to, to assert there is no truth is already to 
enter into a contradiction because yeah. you <laughs> yeah. are making an assertion about things that you say is transcendent that undermines the very right. you know, say, the, truth the, of the this statement what, you are making. This is what winds me up is that so much of the, of the social justice ideology depends upon the very things that they seek to de decry, you know, so much of it. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're this emphasis on, on the, the destruction of grand narratives of tradition, of the grand narrative, say, religion or science or whatever. And they're advancing their own grand narrative. And this is their narrative. Their narrative is that they are on the right side of history. They are uniquely qualified to detect the oppressive power structures that dominate our lives. And they're the ones that will lead us out, out of this to the promised land. So it, it, it is by nature incoherent. But more than that, the, the incoherence is celebrated and often deliberately advanced. I mean, you take it right back to the to 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 the post-structuralists. They were doing that deliberately in what they wrote, because part of the point is the incoherence, because there is no truth. But and yet they're expressing that as though it is true. I mean, it it doesn't make it doesn't make sense even on their own terms. Yes, and I think that's where that's also where the answer lies, though, because and this is where I think, I mean, this is what the whole Platonic corpus is about: is about bringing out of the questioning, the interlocutor the back and forth of the, of the, of the, of the dialogue right. itself to bring out that our very thinking has a relation to realities that transcend us. Right. And so I, I think this is one of the things that needs to be said about the, in relation to various protests of persistent inequalities or uh, uh, of uh, you know, racism or any, any other form of injustice is that yeah. to point those very things out depends on the assertion of, of an ideal that mm. you can only know what is straight. And sorry, we only, you can only look at what it, say that something is crooked by view of what is straight. You can only point out injustice with, with, in, with respect to a, an ideal of what justice is. And so the critical stance precisely depends on is already implicated in, and let's call it an intellectual, conceptual, metaphysical reality according to which the criticism has its bite. And you say, gosh, you're right. That was wrong. It was wrong in relation to what would have been right. It, because it works. The, the, the process right. works. The, 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 <laughs> there's a reason why the Socratic method is, is an ideal when it comes to argumentation, because it does. But if, if you approach it merely as, well, in this situation, how is racism or power manifesting itself? If that's, your, if that's how you approach any kind of dispute, then it, it, you're sabotaging everything. What were you looking to accomplish by creating the character of Titania McGrath? I, so I don't think it, I don't think it was as orchestrated as it seems in, insofar as I, I mostly did it to entertain myself. I think if I'm being honest. Okay. So, because I didn't, I had no idea the, the account would take off. I mean, I just started on Twitter for obvious reasons, Twitter is the battleground that, that social justice activists use to disseminate their ideas. So it makes complete sense that if you're going to satirize that, do it on their own turf. And so that's Twitter. Um, and then she started getting th thousands of followers and I didn't, you know, and, and, and then I got a book deal to write as her and then a second book and then a live tour and all this. So it sort of exploded out, you know, and then it, but, but that's having said that, uh, there, was all, there was always a thought process behind the satirical points being made which I suppose is what you're getting at. Um, and that thought process is to do with, uh, a t I, I suppose, uh, a standard satirical uh, conceit of um, reflecting uh, the vices and absurdities that, that, I, that I perceive um, by emulating them, exaggerating them sometimes, uh, treating them hyperbolically in, in, in my form of expression, or, or trying to tease out those contradictions that we were talking about, the, the fundamental incoherence of the movement that we, we've already discussed by replication of, of their own viewpoint. That, that was sort of the point. That's why sometimes Titania's statements are indistinguishable from what actual social justice activists say. And sometimes they are pushed into the realm where they're not, where they're even too absurd to be believed. Although I, ha I do know that sometimes when I do that, uh, they end up catching up. That happens an awful lot. You know, um, I, I, I wrote a tweet as to Tanya talking about how in order to prove any white parents should prove that they're not racist by sending their teenage daughters on unaccompanied walking holidays in the tribal regions of northern Pakistan. And then Forbes magazine, I think two weeks later, 
published an article doing exactly that. Why Northern Pakistan should be on every female solo traveler's bucket list. That was the headline. Now, the, now I'd written that knowing that it was an absurd proposition that actually even a social justice activist wouldn't say. And then they said it. And that's happened to me about six or seven times now. Um, so in that respect, and that isn't to be self-aggrandizing or suggest that I have the power of prophecy. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that ultimately, if you know this ideology well, and if you've, if you've read the source materials or the foundational text, if you want to call them that, if you know it well, you, there is nothing too absurd that they will not eventually latch onto. Because the very idea of the denial of objective truth means that absurdity is a natural corollary, I think. Yes, yes. Let's, let's stay with this a bit longer, Andrew, because I think there's very, very deep and, and you know, as it were, fundamental things here. You, know, you say you started Titania partly as a way of amusing yourself, um, but even that's worth thinking about because you know, humor is one of those things that you know, we all think we understand and then you, until you start thinking about it. You say, well, why is something funny? Or what is going on when something is funny? Um, I've thought about this uh, with young children, you know, when you're making a, a, a baby laugh and it could be a very simple thing where you go over here and then you go here and then you go quickly over here and they go, oh, yeah. you know, and so even for, even for the infant, humor depends on a comparison, right? Between what I thought was going to happen and then what happened. Yeah. And that there's a perception that that, that, that uh, difference is funny because it's against expectation. Yeah, I think all humor depends on that consciousness of how something is different from what it, with that to which it is being compared. Yeah. And this comes into satire, I think, because satire fundamentally depends on the, the listener of the joke coming to perceive precisely that distance between the way someone is acting and well, and then the question is what? And I would say in the case of satire, it's somehow in relation to their own declared principles. We, one of the things that's often much misunderstood about humor is that humor is fundamentally on the side of the oppressed or the, power, or the, the, the less powerful. Mm -hmm. It's actually a way of claiming power over, in a sense, the person who is abusing their power by pointing out that very contradiction. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not funny to make fun of someone with, you know, with Down syndrome. That's just right. mean. That's not, that's not a joke. That's just, that's just a, a, a coarse uh, and disgusting abuse of your own power. That's not funny. Sure. What's funny is when someone points out the disjunction between what someone with stature is saying or doing and that which they say they are doing. Right, exactly. And this is why I often think when, when you hear the kind of activists who complain about jokes and the way that jokes normalize hatred and that kind of thing, uh, it, it's because they are interpreting those jokes as automatically interpreting them as mean and not thinking about what they're actually trying to achieve. And, I, and that often makes me think that maybe this is because they have a mean streak themselves, that they're, they're, they're so used I mean, I don't want to speculate about what's going on in people's heads, but there is that quality about it. Like, why would you, why when a comedian jokes about a tragedy, say, why would you jump to the assumption that he or she therefore revels in that tragedy? Why would you do that unless you yourself have that quality that your, your instinct is a mean instinct, is a vicious instinct? Because, because no comedian does this, you know? I mean, even basic things like after 9-11, when, when people would be texting each other with, sick jokes about 9-11, right? And part of the joke was, was an acknowledgement that you absolutely shouldn't laugh at this. Part of the reason why it, it created, a, a, why humor can be created out of that, it, it is a, a means to reinforce the, the, that it is a tragic event. That's part of the point. Um, so I think this um, assumption that jokes of all things are there to, to normalize bigotry and hatred and, and, to, and to attack the vulnerable, I mean, nine times, I mean, I'm, I'm, I suppose that, that could conceivably be the case. Like you say, a, a joke about a Down syndrome person, um, which has no other uh, effect but to uh, denigrate that person. Well, I can't name a single comedian who would make such a joke, okay? But the assumption is that people, like to give a very obvious example, when Louis C.K.'s 
set was leaked. Do you remember he, he, he did a sort of work in progress show and it was leaked. And a substantial section of that was talking about these uh, school survivors of school shootings. And the way it was reported in the mainstream press, by the way, in, in mainstream publications was Louis C.K. makes fun of the victims of school massacres. Now, if you listen to what he did and you genuinely come to that conclusion, it means you don't understand a joke. You don't understand what comedy is doing. Of course, I mean, the baseline assumption should be that he thinks it's a tragedy. And we all share that and we all know that. But this, interpreta- this misinterpretation of that, and, and I can't decide whether that's willful or whether people have just reached this kind of uh, point where they will interpret comedy literally. Jokes cannot be sustained with literal interpretations. They are the opposite of that. They are not literal statements of, of what a comedian thinks. They can never be. It doesn't work. It wouldn't be funny. So um, to what extent, so to give another example, when um, the comedian Andrew Lawrence posted a tweet, it was a joke tweet. I, I'm going to get this wrong, but let me try it. He said, um, uh, there's, he, he pointed out the disparity in suicide rates between men and women, that more men uh, commit suicide than women. And he said, if feminists really cared about equality, they would have to even that up by killing themselves, right? Now, then there was a, and I'm not doing the joke justice because that's not quite, but that was the concept behind the joke. And then there was a petition by a group of activists calling him, for, him to be banned from TV, banned from radio, banned from the BBC, on the grounds that he was inciting women to kill themselves. Now, the only way that you can think that, I mean, you may not like the joke and that's fine. You may not think it's funny. You may think it's distasteful. And that is a reasonable uh, response to have. I, and even to be offended, that is completely reasonable. But to make the leap, that this comedian is therefore deliberately and willfully trying to incite women to kill themselves. I mean, you can't think that, can you? You can't have that literal minded infantile view mm-hmm. of a joke, right? So I wouldn't, have bothered, I wouldn't have minded if the petition was simply, I find this offensive, I hate it. But there wasn't that. It was, it was a, a misunderstanding of what the joke was doing and it was a, intuiting a motive that the comedian didn't have. And this is like, this is absolutely everywhere now. And it's not just in terms of comedy, but in terms of, art as well, trying to, and this goes way back, like we say, this goes way back to the stuff that I was studying as an English literature student. Books like Sexual Politics by Kate Millett, which was about, which was, I think, published in the early 70s, wasn't it? And that was just um, picking apart famous novel, the work of famous novelists like D.H. Lawrence and trying to identify where the sexism lies, where the misogyny lies. When I was an undergraduate, you just, you just take a text and find out where it was homophobic or you would tease out its uh, racist implications and you'd get a first, you know? And that's, that's this thing, this sort of moralizing view and this attempt, this is, this is at the heart of the deconstructive approach, isn't it? That you, that you, you, you find what the, what, the, uh, what the artist or the creator is doing, what power structures is that person attempting to uphold, what that person secretly thinks. And that's, that's why, and like I say, these things di- um, become part of mainstream culture now, which is why whenever you get into an argument, on Twitter with a social justice activist, they will always tell you what you are secretly thinking. They will always tell you that they know what you are secretly thinking, that they have this kind of um, uh, access to your private thoughts. That, that fundamentally goes back to what we were saying earlier, that if there is no truth, there is no independent structure to reality, yeah. everything is only a manifestation of a will to power. And so right, exactly. that, that's why Cynical Theories is a great title for this uh, book you mentioned by Pluckrose and Lindsay, because the standpoint of cynicism is fundamentally that. It's saying, right. no, there is no, there is no deeper reality here. There is no authenticity. There's no sincerity. There is no truth or beauty or anything like that. It is only ever a manifestation of a will to power. And if you're not acknowledging that, that's just because you don't know what your actual will to power is. So it's, it's, it's to deny the most, the, the bedrock of human subjectivity, which is right. that it is connected to the, the whole wonderful complexity and often terrible nature of reality itself. No one says like, this is easy or, or simple. It's, it's, it's the deep complexity of the real. And like, like you say, this is why intent is not considered important now. This is, you know, this goes back to Roland Barthes and the death of the author, the idea that it doesn't matter what as a creator you're intended to achieve. Uh, what matters is the, uh, the perpetuation of power structures that, uh, that results. You know, if you, I mean, that's why you'll say even with a, a joke that people attack or that people find offensive. Sometimes they'll say this person is trying to stir up hate. Um, or sometimes they say it doesn't matter what the intention of that person was. This is the impact of what, what, what will happen anyway, because this is my truth. This is my interpretation of what that person has said. And, and you cannot denigrate my truth. Um, yeah, I, I think that's why 
teasing this stuff out is quite important because it affects, it has an impact on the, on the arts. It has an impact on the way in which we can create the things that we can do. Um, be, because it, because it has this insistence on, on literalizing absolutely everything. Um, I mean, I can think of some, some specific examples. I mean, to, to, okay, so to take an example from, I did a stand up show in the Edinburgh Fringe Festival a couple of years ago, where a woman stood up in the show and tried to stop the show, com complained vocally, because she perceived that I was being misogynistic. And I wasn't being misogynistic. I was, I was mocking the, the then leader of the country, Theresa May, the prime minister. Um, and my persona on stage is quite a catty, waspish kind of on stage. It's a theatrical, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't slag off Theresa May's appearance as Andrew Doyle as a person. I wouldn't, I don't do things like that. My, my persona on stage does because that's, that's part of what he is. He's this waspish, catty character. Um, I said that she was starting to look very haggard. I said that she was starting to resemble a, an NHS poster warning about the dangers of dehydration. That was the, that was the joke. And she took real offences, even though I'd been doing similar things about male politicians, that didn't matter. So she'd interpreted this in this way, misinterpreted it. Um, and then what, what I did was, I mean, what I should have done actually is if, if, if she was saying that I'm a misogynist because of this joke that I'm making, what I should have done in character was to actually explicitly become a misogynist, explicitly say misogynistic thing. I should have, that would have been the more theatrically interesting thing to do. What I actually did, I think, was explain the joke, which doesn't make, doesn't help because then it's no longer funny. But in retrospect, that's what I should have done. It would have been much more theatrically interesting. But if you approach stand-up comedy or any art form from a literal mindset, you can't appreciate the theatricality of that. Maybe being offended and being uncomfortable and being shocked in a, in a co comedic context is actually quite an interesting thing. Is actually something that that we can. There's a purpose to it, you know, and it, it's it's a, a it's a bad faith interpretation of the comedian if you think that all they're trying to do is is be mean or be nasty. I mean, that's maybe there are comics. Yeah, yeah well, don't. that's why I I think Andrew that there there's a there's a there's a metaphysical underpinning to humor, and let, just right. let me spell this this out. Tell me what you think. You know, this is one of the reasons it's so important to be able to make a joke about something tragic is that to be able to, to laugh at something, let's say something terrible happens in, in, in your life, uh, you, you, diagnosis medically or, or a, a loss of some, some, some kind. I mean, we're all living in the midst of suffering of various kinds. I mean, life is finite and to be human is to confront the, the, the immense difficulty of our finitude. And yet to be able to laugh at, at something terrible that has happened to us, I don't mean laughing at something terrible that's happened to someone else in that di di uh, diminishing way. It is in a way to be able to reclaim our own wholeness from that tragedy. It is to be oh, able to I, transcend that which has been done to us to take an active, an active reclaiming of ourselves. And to, if that is possible, it must mean that reality itself enables that reclaiming and that reality is not something, a zero sum uh, uh, thing looking to obliterate you and either you claim your power and hurt others or you will be hurt. It is actually to say, no, there's a non-zero sum nature to reality itself. And my being able to laugh at this is a demonstration or incarnation of that. Sure. I mean, a, re a repudiation of reality means that joke humor itself uh, cannot work anymore. And that, that idea is so key. What you're describing there is, is so key to the way that we uh, navigate life and existence as human beings. I mean, I, I suppose it's because I've, I've experienced it all my life. I mean, I have family and, you know, obviously my family are from Northern Ireland and they live through the troubles and they often joked about, I mean, I, I've heard members of my family joke about some quite harrowing things that happened to them, you know? Um, and that is a way that you, like you say, it's a way to claim a kind of, not to let yourself be the victim anymore. It's a way for you to claim control o over exactly. a situation. Dennis exactly. Leary used to talk about that. Dennis Leary used to do jokes, stand-up routines about cancer and things like that, and he'd get a lot of flack for it. Um, again, because the simplistic interpretation is that you're laughing because people are dying of cancer, which is of course not not the case. But he said that people would come up to him afterwards and say to and give requests, say like, "Oh, I've had testicular cancer. Could you do something about testicular cancer? Why didn't you do that?" Almost like they wanted to own this as well. 
Um, and that's such a deep and beautiful thing. I mean, it's it's a little bit like why is sad music more beautiful than happy music? You know, if you think about the most beautiful music that you can, uh, I, I, I wish we could play some, you know, an example here of what, I, what I'm trying to get at here. But it's the yeah. way in which the return to tonic at the end has taken up, the return to harmony takes up the discord. And so you've, you've taken up and overcome, not denied or denigrated, but given the suffering its place, but it's been transcended into a deeper and more coherent standpoint. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what laughter, and in a certain sense, all knowing is, is a, re, is, a, is a making comprehensible of the otherness and difficulty of experience. Right. And, and in particular, the reality of death, like you say. The, you know, there is something funny about being the only creature on this planet that is aware of its own mortality. There is something funny about that because we, we carry on life as normal. We do all the things that we, all the mundane things, all the paying of the bills, all the going to, all the stuff that ultimately with the recognition that there will come a time where none of that will matter and we will, we will be nothing. Right? So that, that, that's a funny thing, isn't it? I, I, I think there's something quite hilarious about that. The, well, to be able to laugh at that is point. actually to transcend, in a certain sense, to transcend death. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, I think the existentialist had a point about this. Is, is that why you're not, you know, the, the very fact that you are alive means that you are investing in existence. You know, it's, it's that question of why don't you kill yourself, right? Well, I mean, it wouldn't matter if I did, I guess, but, but I have invested something in existence. I believe in the sanctity of human life. Um, but I'm also aware in the fundamental absurdity of human life. And, and the acknowledgement of the absurdity is a coping mechanism I suppose not e not even a coping mechanism because I think that's quite cynical I think it's a celebration of, of of life actually it is to enter into a standpoint that sees more than our own life to be at work in life that's why you know wh wh why something can terrible can be funny is because we're not simply constructing a reality in which that thing is not terrible it's ultimately a redemptive logic, right? Because you're saying, yeah. no, this is not zero sum. The very fact that this terrible thing can happen and that I can become greater than it means that somehow I am participating in a deeper underlying reciprocity to the real itself. So here's, here's a question for you, just, just to, to push on this very point. Yeah. It's one thing for you to be making the joke uh, as the author of Titania, yeah. or the, the person behind Titania. But do you think it's funny when you are, the self, when you are yourself the subject of humor? Because this is really the test of, of our own principles, right? Can we laugh at ourselves? How do you prevent yourself from becoming the thing that you are criticizing? Yeah, I totally, I totally understand that. It's about reminding yourself to laugh at yourself, <laughs> basically. And it, it, it is that thing of um, nobody... Nobody likes to be laughed at or, or because there is a, a way in which humor can be used as a bullying tool, right? There, there is. And it's absolutely futile to deny that because we all know it from the playground, you know? Um, and that's, that's, not, that's not just, not only is that not something that I, I, I mean, I don't do that. So I don't pick on people and, and, and make jokes about them and say, look, at, look, everyone, laugh at this person. That's just bullying. I don't do that. And, yeah, and, exactly. And nor do comedians generally. I, I don't know of comedians that do that. You know, I mean, it's not funny. It's actually it's not, not funny. Right, it's just mean. Right. That's the whole so point. Someone, that you... So if someone's making a joke about me on Twitter and it is just mean, it is just horrible and mean, and it's attacked me, then no, I do not like that. Because, and I think I wouldn't be a human being if I if I did. Um, if someone makes a good natured joke about something I've said or me, indeed, then I then I'll, I'll be the first to laugh at it. And maybe that's just an instinctive thing. Um, but I, and I think it's important to draw that distinction. Uh, a personal attack that uses humor, uh, is a form of bullying. And no, I don't think that's funny. Um, I mean, they're free to do it. And this is the other thing, like you're, you're free to do, to say whatever you want, but I don't have to appreciate it or, or get on board, but a good natured joke about someone, we all know we've all got groups of friends where we take the piss out of each other. This is sort of at the heart of friendship is the ability to laugh at yourself. Um, that's how friendships are sustained. I can't imagine having friends that don't mock me <laughs> all the time. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, 
and and we're all the same like that. I think we I think we are. Um, yeah. Well, let's 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 talk about that for a minute because that's that's a very that's a very deep point. Why is it that friendship, at least very often, needs depends upon the ability of your friends to point out your failings in a way right. that you laugh at them? Well, I suppose it's partly to do with this. Is why I think so many people in the social justice movement don't have a sense of humor, because to have a sense of humor about yourself means you're acknowledging your flaws, right? And it's such a totalitarian instinct that they don't believe they have flaws. And they, they have such a utopian worldview, they think they've got all the answers. And that is not compatible with a sense of humor. You know, that's, <laughs> what, that's, what, that's why you see this very po-faced thing. That's why Titania McGrath is such a po-faced, the image of her, the face uh, that my friend Lisa put together for me, is po-faced. She cannot laugh. She's never laughed. I think she laughed once as a child and she regrets it. You know, so there's, that, that's, that's what I'm getting at. But it's interesting what you say as well about that distinction between humor used to bully and humor or satire used to expose a vice or a folly. So uh, I had a recent experience which um, might help to illustrate some of the points you're making. If it doesn't, just you can cut it out of the conversation. It might be, it might be a red herring. So I, did, I posted a tweet about, now what Tanya often does is, 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 is find newspaper articles that express this kind of absurd social justice mania, right? And, 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 and she'll post the article uh, and they're usually from mainstream uh, press. So there was an article, I, it was from something like The Telegraph, like a major uh, broad, broad, broadsheet paper in the country, a major news outlet. And I'm, uh, I did a screenshot of the article, as she normally does, and made some joke about content of the article. I can't remember exactly what it was. Now, the person who wrote the article, because their name appeared in the screenshot, because obviously they wrote the article, uh, then had some unpleasant attention from people on Twitter attacking her for her absurdity, right? And then she sent me an email saying that she, she was feeling bullied and that she, she was feeling attacked and that I'd, I'd uh, initiated the bullying, right? And I responded to her, she didn't respond to my response, but my, my, the point that I was making was that I, it, it, this is not an, there is, a, there is a difference here. I did not post that joke in order to mock her or attack her or to, or, or to get people to bully her. I was mocking the idea that was being expressed through a major newspaper. And, th and the point is simply this, that if as satirists we cannot mock um, mainstream news outlets, politicians, people in power, if we're not allowed to punch up, then there is pretty much nothing we can do, right? That, and that was, I, was, I was asking the question, how can satire work if I cannot make a comment about something in a very powerful institution such as a mainstream news outlet how can that work and yet at the same token i don't like the idea that some idiots uh sent some mean and horrible messages to her off the back of my tweet but that's not my responsibility that's their responsibility and it's certainly not something i've ever promoted or advanced so i think that maybe that anecdote is useless but i'm, I'm trying to draw out this distinction between but i'm always thinking comedians are always thinking is this joke fair and, and is it justified? And, and I can justify every joke I've ever said. And you might disagree and say, well, actually, I think you've, you've made a miscalculation there and that what you're doing there is actually a form of, of bullying. And I will reflect on that. And if I think you're right, then I will, uh, then I will concede. But comedians have to be able to make those mistakes anyway. Uh, we're, we're treading such a fine line, uh, that, that, that limit of people's tolerance and what, you know, that, that things are bound to be miscalculated from time to time. Um, but I, but I, what I will say is that any comedian worth their salt doesn't go out of their way to bully anyway. And the assumption shouldn't be that that's what they are trying to do. Yes, this is, that's very, that's very well said. When, when we laugh, our ability to laugh at ourselves is, it is really to surrender our own sense of ourselves in the hope and in the belief that one can have a greater and deeper sense of oneself, right? So that's what laughter, that's what the laughter is. It's, 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 it's surrendering our own sense of self in the hope of reaching a deeper sense of self. Well, it's and, an acknowledgement of the ego and an acknowledgement of that which we have been socialized out of, you know, insofar as a child is solipsistic and sees themselves as being, you know, the center of the world, absolutely everything, and that we 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 learn, we learn uh, to to not hold that worldview. We we learn to empathize. We we 
but it's still there at the core of us, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's still lurking within us. And well, so see, maybe, go on, sorry. No, sorry, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, it's fine, I think I well, finished. To, to, to say, not to be able to laugh at yourself is fundamentally to say that you're, it's a, it's an, it's a fragility of your own subjectivity, right? That is unable yes. to, is uninterested and unwilling, and in fact, in certain sense, doesn't even believe is possible to engage in a deepening movement of your own uh, self knowledge. And that's why I think that the repression of humor is part and parcel of this underlying nihilism, because, and, and that's why it's, it's absolutely related to the denial of, 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 of truth itself, because it's. It's very much of a piece to say that I can't laugh, to not be able to laugh at yourself be because you don't believe anything can come out of the exposure of your own failings mm. is very much the same as to refuse to engage in a discussion that will show mm. how your own views may be either partial or wrong. It's, it's related to the, the fact that, that there is a refusal to discuss or debate. Yes. Uh, 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 yes. Because to open amongst the activists, if they if they open their ideas up to scrutiny, the ideas will fall apart and collapse. And that's what, and 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 it's tied into this utopian worldview and this inability to acknowledge that one, all of us, are often wrong about an awful lot of things at any given time. And I think it probably is connected to um, uh, the way in which a refusal to confront reality or a negation of reality, which manifests itself in say trigger warnings or so, or, or, or says that we know we shouldn't study this thing because it might hurt me. It might, it might, it might upset me and destabilize my, my perception of the world or the truth that I choose to inhabit. I think it is all tied together. And it, I think it, it finds itself in those who would seek to control jokes and humor as well. And moreover, I think it is tied to a fear of loss of individual agency and power. I mean, there's a reason why tyrants and despots kill satirists <laughs> historically. It's a reason why even today that uh, Erdogan in Turkey would have satirists jailed um, for mocking him. Um, it's why Hannah Arendt in her book on violence talks about the, the best way to undermine authority is to mock it, to joke about it. Tyrants hate uh, anyone, anyone who has invested so much in their own sense of uh, righteousness, <laughs> cannot afford to be laughed at, you know? And that's, that's why there is a mistrust of humor and the, and the power of humor in, in, in the very people who are, who, are, who are so determined to expose the power structures that they believe that they can detect because they've taken a gender studies course or a course in critical race theory. So they, they, are, they have that superpower now that they can detect these invisible power structures that dominate society. But in, in themselves, are very wary of uh, a depletion of their own power. I, I find that there's a, a real deep irony that I mean, what they are doing is, is perpetual. I mean, I, I imagine that Foucault would have a great time deconstructing their behavior because let's not forget that what they are doing is a perversion of Foucauldian ideas, not, not a reflection of it. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, and, but of course the, the irony is that that standpoint actually makes you less powerful in a, yeah. in a, in a deeper sense, just as one's inability to admit when one is wrong mm. makes one less right. And so one is actually more in a world of falsehood than one would be if one had the humility to enter into deeper truths about oneself and the world. Isn't that and, strange though that it's not humility? Like it should be something you celebrate. When, when someone has pointed out your, a flaw in your reasoning or, or who you are, or what you think, or what you believe, and you come and you realize that they're right, so either you, you, I mean, obviously we all have egos that are fragile, as you say, but really, is it, is it more or less damaging to the ego to, to perpetuate something you now know not to be true? I'd say that you, what you should be doing is celebrating, say, well, no, of course, that's fantastic. You've, you've, you've proved me wrong. I, I, you know, and this is something I wrote, I, I, I think I sent the article I wrote in Standpoint magazine about critical thinking. And one of the anecdotes that is raised is the Richard Dawkins anecdote when, when he is a, a back as an undergraduate and he was taught, um, um, uh, now what was the name of the organism? Um, this is going to really annoy me now. Uh, anyway, that, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in abstract terms. So they had a visiting speaker come in. who basically, uh, showed that this, 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 this organism was a reality. 
the professor who worked at Oxford had been teaching them for years that it wasn't, it didn't exist. And then all of a sudden he was presented with the evidence and he goes up to the front of the lecture hall after the lecture and says, I want to thank you. I've been wrong this past 15 years and everyone applauds. And that's like, that's, um, uh, the Golgi apparatus, that's what it was. Sorry, <laughs> it just occurred to me. That's the name of this. Uh, uh, look, I know nothing about science whatsoever. I'm talking about the principle. And the principle is celebrating when you've been proven wrong. I mean, what a great, what a liberating thing to be able to do. What a way to actually, uh, it, I don't think it's damaging to the ego. I think we treat it as though it is. But that, but that would suggest to me that if, if you're in an argument or a discussion um, and you never want to be proven wrong and you never want to be exposed where, 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 where there is a dearth of, of thought in your process, then you're arguing for the wrong reasons. What, what you're doing is you're, you're arguing to establish your status. You know, you're arguing to win, not, not, not to explore the discussions, explore the substance of the discussion, right? Does that make sense? I mean, this, really, this is why we come back to this whole fundamental premise about what, what the nature of the human being is. Do you want to live in relation to what's real? Or do you want to live in some delusional state in which, you know, you're, you're unable to interpret and make sense of, in some sense, the complexity of, of reality? I think this is an absolutely critical point because at the heart of this, I mean, if you say, well, I, you know, if you're unable to laugh at yourself, if you don't, you're, you're this mm. wonderful anecdote you've just told about uh, Richard Dawkins and the professor who, who was thankful for having been corrected publicly about humiliated, long... <laughs> What's that? You know, potentially publicly humiliated in front of all of his students that he'd been teaching about this, about this organism for years. So you could interpret that as a form of humiliation or you can interpret it as something positive, right? That's... Well, that's yes, and that's why, that's why, that's why, that's why, the, 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 at, at the bedrock of this is a whole vision of what, of what human subjectivity is in its relation to reality. Because yeah. if you think this is a zero sum game in which somehow it's all about your own truth, well then of course that's gonna be threatened if it turns out that, you know, that, that your uh, limited standpoint was mm. not the true one. But if actually you think that your subjectivity is constituted and more fully constituted by a fuller relation to what's real, well then you, you rejoice. You say, well, gosh, I don't wanna go for another second of my life deluded into thinking something that, that is, 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 is false is true. And well, so, maybe, yeah, go ahead. No, well, I was just gonna say, maybe, maybe this accounts for the sheer venom uh, that, I, that I experience from people who are angry about the Titania character. Because I think maybe it's to do with the fact that she does expose something um, about their worldview that is on the face of it ridiculous. Maybe what's happening is people are recognizing it. Maybe, maybe, maybe what they see, maybe they can, maybe it's having that effect, you know, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to account for the, the, the vitriol. I wouldn't be able to account for it. You know, if I hear a joke and I don't find it funny, then I just don't laugh and that's the end of it. What I don't do is go on Twitter and call someone a, a fascist, evil, ugly, Nazi scumbag who deserves to be killed or thrown in a volcano I had. Um, and, you know, and the threats, <laughs> actual threats that get emailed to me, that, that, that kind of level, that would suggest it's having an impact, actually, that maybe they're starting to rethink and it's uncomfortable. It's what um, Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay wrote a book called How to Have Impossible Conversations. They talk about this idea of identity quakes. I don't think they originated the term, but they talk about it really eloquently. And the, the idea that to, to have something that is so inherent to your meaning and your identity as a human being destabilized is an unpleasant thing. That's why when someone persuades you that you are wrong about something and you have to let go of something, it's almost like you're killing off a part of yourself. It's never easy to be dissuaded. It's never a comfortable... Um, and particularly when politics is so wrapped up in identity, as it is now, that the idea of being left wing or right wing is now not just a, a matter of perspective, but is, is something that is considered integral uh, to one's uh, sense of self, right? So maybe that's why, I mean, I'm just raising this, but maybe the venom, it's always surprised me, the venom, because, because I always think, well, if you don't find it funny, that's fine, just ignore it, <laughs> you know? That, that, so maybe that explains the venom, that maybe they are starting to, maybe they can see the point of her. Maybe that maybe they, Maybe they get it, and that's why they're upset. Well, this is why I think you're, 
satirical work is so important because it's not a private, I mean, it's not a narcissistic, it's not, a, it's not an act of narcissism or uh, uh, self-congratulatory uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, egoism. You make public jokes in the hope that, con that it will bring others to a consciousness of what is going on. So there is no, there is no getting, there is, this is what the whole thing about humor. There is no getting of the joke. The joke doesn't have any stature at all until it's gotten, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. precisely the coming to consciousness of what is funny or what the discrepancy is between what has been pointed out and the way someone has acted, say, their, their hypocrisy or whatever. So yes. it, I take it that you have adopted this satirical standpoint precisely out of a, you might say this, I know many will disagree with me here, but it's a, it's a profoundly good faith stance. Yeah. Because you are under actually believing that those that you are uh, satirizing yeah. are capable of coming themselves to a more adequate, more complete standpoint. It is a fundamentally optimistic project. Yes, I think I uh, returned to uh, W.H. Orton's definition of satire, a distinction between satire and comedy, where he talks about satire being angry and optimistic. You know, it, it rails against these things, but it fundamentally believes that it can change and we can change for the good. And whereas comedy, he describes as good natured and pessimistic insofar as it's resigned to how terrible things are and so just laughs at it, right? And I think that's a really, uh, useful distinction. I've mentioned it a number of times because I just think it really nails something about that, that satire is about an aspiration for societal, societal change, whether or not that comes about. The aspiration is there. So it is a fundamentally, and it's also a fundamentally humane thing insofar as it, it, it believes that people are not beyond redemption, that, that, that if you, if you, if you, as we do with our friends, as we were discussing, if you mock your friend for a flaw that they have or for something they're doing wrong, you know, often the mockery is what will wake wake them up to that, and 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 actually that's something that you should be grateful for. Uh, if, if someone, you know, if someone were to satirize my political position and and ruthlessly mock it and expose it as being weak, then that I would probably be grateful for that. I, I you know, that it would enable me to to reflect on it, and it would be, you know, I think that's something. Obviously, you have to overcome that hurdle of the ego and the the the, the, the as I said before the the temptation to interpret this as a, a form of humiliation, but then you see, you're just wrapped up in your status there, which we all are, of course, we can't escape it, but, but, you know, through thought and, and patience, we can overcome that. And I, and that's why I think, yes, I think you're right. I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I, but I, I do believe that what I'm doing is good natured and, and optimistic and is more than anything driven by, uh, a, an optimism about humanity and a, a, a hatred of bullying. I think, I mean, so what, what's time, to, although I'm often accused of bullying because I'm you know, mocking uh, identity politics. The misinterpretation there, of course, is I'm never mocking marginalized groups or vulnerable groups. I'm mocking those in power who uh, paternalistically feel that they can look after and, and, and determine what those groups should think and feel. So it's, it's the opposite of what they think. It's, it's, it's everything is about, and because I do feel the social justice movement, it, it legitimizes bullying. I've seen, all you need to do, if anyone's unclear about this, is 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 just have a look at the the venom and the vitriol that J.K. Rowling has experienced from people who claim to be on the right side of history, claim to be the good guys. I have never in my life seen such sustained, uh, all, just misogyny, frankly, just m the most grotesque, crude misogyny, hatred of her because she is a woman. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and these are thousands and thousands of tweets. They were all sort of collected by someone on, on Medium. Someone collected all of these screenshots and it, it makes you sick. And, it, and it's often those who are, that's, that's the danger I see in the social justice movement is that it bullies people from a perspective that it thinks it's being compassionate. It doesn't recognize its own, th that it's the bully. And um, Titania is an effort to expose this bullying and to stand up against bullying because I hate it. Um, and ironically, then I am accused of, of bullying. And the reason for that is the bullies believe themselves to be the underdogs in this case. Yeah, I, I, that's why I see a, there to be a profoundly 
positive vision behind all s- s- true and effective satire, and that to be true in your case. And, it, and again, it comes back to these, to an underlying vision of what the real is, that truth is not subject to power. And that's why to take a standpoint of courage against bullies, it's not a, calcu- it's not a power calculation. It's not, right. it's not one in which you say, oh, I'm going to win this fight. Well, you may lose. I mean, you might be taken out. You can be you can be killed by a bully or or disenfranchised or whatever. But to actually speak truth to power is precisely to put your faith in the transcendence of truth itself, which is not subject to power. And there's a lot. You're already tra- so you're transcending the dominant uh, zero sum nihilism that is at work precisely by standing up and pointing towards a principle that transcends power. And there's a risk that comes with that, a very, a very great risk. I mean, we're seeing that manifesting in cancel culture, what we call cancel culture now. And uh, I've just written an article about this, about how I think we need to be braver. I think we need to, you know, when, when, when the HR department comes to us and tell us that we need to do these training courses to elucidate our own unconscious biases. And, you know, we, we need to say, well, actually, we need a conversation about whether this is effective or useful or, or you know, or, I mean, I mentioned in that article, a friend of mine, an actor friend of mine, she was, her agent phoned her up and she said, and, and said, you haven't posted in support of Black Lives Matter on your Twitter account. You have to do that. That's compulsory. Because if you don't do that, you're never going to get cast in anything again. And to stand up to that and say, it's not about whether or not I support Black Lives Matter. The principle here is that I shouldn't be compelled to, to, to express support for something by someone else, right? And to stand up for that principle I mean, ultimately, it would cost her her career and livelihood. It would. So it's hard. The, 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 the personal costs of this are really, really hard. It's not for someone like me because I don't have a boss, you know, and I, and I do what I want and I, don't, and, I, and I say what I want and I'm not being censored. But if I still worked as a teacher, if I still worked in the call center, if I still had the jobs I used to have, then I couldn't, I couldn't say the things I say. So that, that's something, like I say, I think, and we know this, like we, we learned this at school. Standing up to the bullies is not a way to secure power for yourself. It is often, it is often a dangerous thing to do. And then, and then when en- enough people do it then, it, then then the bullying is overcome. I mean, I, I made this analogy in the article I wrote about Salem, and it seems obvious, and it's become almost cliched. But look, the only reason they stopped hanging people is because sufficient numbers of those villagers started saying, no, this isn't real, is this? This is, you know. Once the governor's wife was accused, they were emboldened. They, you know, they were able to do this. But, but it came a kind of tipping point. And I think there's a similar, we're looking for a similar kind of tipping point now. A recognition that these ideologues are in the minority. It's just they're incredibly powerful. And they've infiltrated all our powerful institutions, cultural and political and educational. So uh, it, 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 there is a risk. And a lot of people will fall. And a lot of people will lose their jobs uh, by standing and already have lost their jobs by standing up to this stuff. But there will be a tipping point when a sufficient number of people say, no, uh, this isn't uh, the society we want to live in. We don't want this nihilistic worldview. We don't, we don't want to reject all objective truth. And we don't want to be compelled to say things that we know not to be true, more importantly, which is the tactic of all uh, despots. And when, when sufficient numbers do that, then it will embolden the government, which has been completely uh, negligent when it comes to this, because they, they, they feel under the thumb of the, the, of the, of, of the influence of social justice activists as well. Um, you know, no one wants to be called racist. No one wants to be called a Nazi. The fear of that, because it's so debilitating in society to have that brand, you know, whether it's true or not, it's the, 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 the and they know this. They know that, you know, this, this is the point that it is, it is somewhat ironic that the only reason cancel culture is effective, the only reason why smearing someone as a racist without cause is an effective strategy is because we live in a society where to do so makes you a pariah. That, it undermines their point. They see racism everywhere. It, it's not, it's still, it's, it's, it, it, and the very fact that their, their smearing campaign will have an effect is because they're wrong about this. It's, be, it's because we live in a society that doesn't tolerate racism. Not, not because we live in a society that enables it. We absolutely don't tolerate it, and nor should we. This is very powerful, Andrew. The only way to resist totali- the totalitarian worldview that truth is subject to power is to speak truth with courage. 
because yeah. that truth speaking is the only antidote to the nihilism that would coerce you into not doing so. And the only way we can preserve a space for human beings to flourish is to speak the truth without fear. Right. Absolutely. You wrote a wonderful piece recently on critical thinking and uh, what it means to be a critical thinker. Um, of course, what is called critical thinking today in many universities is really just uh, con conventional forms of ideology that are digested uh, uh, hook, line, and sinker without any critical capacity whatsoever. And so what are called critical studies are very often profoundly uncritically accepted. Yes, they are. So what I want to ask you about is how you, you think independence of mind, a genuinely uh, critical cast of mind, can mm. be cultivated. How, how did that come about in your case? Did it have to do with your careful reading of the history of literature? Uh, uh, what were the uh, generative or transformative moments towards your developing a subtle, a nuanced standpoint in relation to the complexity of reality that was not simply doing what others said or feeling you must do what they say? I think it's partly instinct and part hard experience. I, I think um, I, I, I've, I've always been sort of questioning uh, uh, when I'm told something, but maybe that's because my background, I, I don't suppose that was always the case thinking about it. I mean, maybe it's to do with coming from a, uh, a religious background. Maybe it's to do with, with um, uh, where I, I suppose in order to have an objective view of identity politics and the damage it does, I think it helps to have come from a background where identity was very important to you. I think I, uh, my identity as a Catholic, for instance, I think was very important to me, particularly up until the age of 18. I think going to a convent school and all those sort of things and, and, and um, you know, it has real meaning for me and it still does. And I think that's, so having an awareness, here's what I mean, having an awareness of the allure of being part of an identity that is more than yourself is a good it helps you to understand where this is coming from i think certainly in terms of gay identity i i you know for i was very much part of the gay scene at a time when actually you would still say it in under hushed tones you know and and i understand the allure of that as well there's something quite thrilling about feeling that you're part of a group uh and that and that, and that you're part of a group that more 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 than that that is that is victimized there's something quite thrilling about it um and and appealing and so and so i do understand the identitarian worldview because i think i have to a degree experienced it um and i and i think we all have we all we all understand that idea of of, of the comfort that comes from from feeling part of a group and uh but then i think i i the more i read i think the way out of it is reading the more i read about it the more skeptical i kept, became about it um i I was never, I, 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 I started challenging the idea of identifying, you know, people would describe me as a gay comedian, for instance. And I, I started to push back on that a bit because I would say, well, I don't think I am a gay comedian. I'm a, I'm a comedian who happens to be gay. For me, being gay is, is the same as being five foot 10 or, or being right-handed. You know, it's not, it's not, it's a mundane uh, aspect of who I am. Not something, not, I don't want to see the world through that. You know, I don't want, I, I think that's a damaging. That's the, that's the point I'm at at the moment is I, I just think identity politics is damaging to you as an individual as well, to everyone individually. And I don't, I simply don't want to do it. And the expectation that we should is, is, a, is a real problem. So I imagine that's where it comes from. I think, but who knows? I mean, I'm speculating here. I don't know. I don't know why. I think the best thing that anyone can do is read a lot. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's it. I think I've just read an awful lot and I've read a lot of people's, perspectives that I've, I've done a lot of uncomfortable reading and so far as I've read things that I don't I bulk at it you know instinctively and I found kernels of truth within it um there are even kernels of truth within some of the social justice stuff that comes out you know I've read a lot of those books um there are books I mean like White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo which has very little to recommend itself and even the the things she says that I mean there are occasional good points but they're just so fundamentally undermined by the fact that she builds her entire thesis on a false premise. You know, once the first step of an argument is wrong, 
the whole argument falls apart. So, you know, whatever good could have come out of that book is, is it cannot, is not there, unfortunately, because it's just too rooted in this, this belief system that isn't, that is so wrong. Um, but you can read other, other, other people's books and, 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 and garner certain things from it. Absolutely. And I think that's the key. I think, I think education is the key. And I, and I don't mean that in the way that the social justice activists mean when they say, oh, educate yourself. What they mean is read white fragility and agree with it when they say that. Um, true education is about reading a wide variety of ideas and thinking about it, considering, reflecting on it, and, and, and having the humility to accept that the position you're at might be, will be wrong. It will be wrong. There's absolutely no way um, that, that you were right about everything. That is, is an impossibility. So, so that's, that's, I think, where the solution lies. I think reinstating genuine critical thinking in schools is going to be the key. And by that, I don't know. I mean, I've had a lot of conversations with people about this, with educationalists particularly. You know, I used to teach a subject called critical thinking at A-level in school. And um, I can see that that's not necessarily the way to go about this. I think it should be, these ideas should be embedded in, in the way we think about everything across the curricula in all subjects, not... Otherwise, you just end up with a subject and people think, oh, we've covered how to think critically in that subject. And then we can, you know, we can go back to just being spoon fed absolutely everything else we need to pass the exams and everything in other regard. Well, actually, it should be a more kind of fundamental change in pedagogy. It should be something fundamental about the way things are taught that we don't currently have. Um, teaching people to think questioningly, to challenge, to think critically isn't something that should be just... Uh, boxed into one subject called critical thinking having said that i think there is some merit to teaching the socratic method to teaching basic principles of argumentation to kids so that they know that once you throw an insult once you make an ad hominem attack you've lost the argument once you've intuited the motive of someone else you've lost the argument well all these very very basic uh, fallacies um but if you know them uh and if everyone adheres to them um, we can have we can reach we can have these discussions these difficult discussions um, that people aren't willing to have at the moment. So I think that's the, that would be the way I'd like to see that I'd see like to see fundamental changes in the educational system to incorporate a uh, critical thinking. That's the way I would approach it. Yes, and do you think that critical thinking, learning to think critically, can be detached from content? Insofar as you know, my well, my sense of things certainly is that. The idea that you can learn to think crit critically without some engagement with content itself, that is to say, it could be history, it could be suffering, yeah. it could be a poem, uh, that is actually to, to reaffirm the very constructivist standpoint that uh, we need to transcend. Because if you could just bring it all out of yourself, it, you know, it endlessly yeah. by just, oh, all of a sudden I'm going to become a critical thinker. I mean, it, one becomes more critical by engagement with the actual complexity of reality. And of course, you know, books are a way of, of accessing that. So is suffering. So, I mean, war and poverty, all kinds of things can awaken one to a sense of the limits of one's standpoint and perspective. Um, yeah. uh, and I think that in education, we've had you know, one, of the, one of the reasons we're not cultivating critical thinkers is because we don't think the content matters. We think, you know, oh, it's, sure. just, you know it's just all about your opinions. It's all about your own endless emotional no, it, it, expressivism. I totally we have to know things. We have to have a basic bedrock of knowledge <laughs> upon which to build. And, and, and that's, yeah, I don't think uh, thinking critically can work if, if, if you are ignorant of, 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 I mean, just to give an example, I mean, I remember being at school in the history class and we were taught about the long march in China. Um, and, but rather than um, uh, learning the facts of what happened and when and who was involved, we were asked to write a diary piece as a soldier on the march as you know, outlining how we felt about it. Okay, um, that's not useful now to me. So I, I, I would, I would have been in a much stronger position now educationally uh, if I, if they'd have just rammed the facts home and got them into my brain, and then I can start thinking about those other ideas. You know, so, so there's, it's, there is that shift in, um, uh, in, in education generally to teach it from a position of, uh, well, they call it, they call it empathetic, but I don't think that's quite right. But, they, but, but. You know, what is your opinion about this? So how do you feel about this? Rather than, no, just learn the basic facts. I think, I always feel that I've been totally failed by education in that respect. Uh, and and the, the way that it currently works, I think people need to become autodidacts. You know, they need to just teach themselves and, and, and 
once you have a bedrock of knowledge to build upon, then, and then you're in a good position. And you also, you also then learn an awareness that you, you'll never know enough. <laughs> there's, there's so much we don't know. And that will always be the case. But, but it's a start, isn't it? To learn. That's why uh, universities have developed canons. That's where the canon comes from. It's a recognition that we cannot know everything. So we need to build on uh, decades of people refining the things that we should be prioritized when it comes to learning about the past. That's why the canon exists. So this idea of destroying the canon of English literature, say, you know, as Sheffield University recently put out a video saying the only reason that we all study Shakespeare and Chaucer is because they're white men. Well, this is not true. And, and it's ignorant and, and it's dangerous. Um, if, 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 if we cannot say that some things are objectively better than others, if we cannot do that anymore, if we can say that the only reason that Shakespeare has any merit is because he was white and male and privileged and, and that all of his work is about oppressing other groups, then we're lost. We're utterly lost. So It's precisely to deny the universality of our human experience, uh, you know, the whole identitarian standpoint of which you know, these things are only relevant because, I don't know, this, this, you know, you're gay and this author was gay or whatever the right. case, or you know, you're white and this author was white, or you're a man and this author was a man. That's precisely yeah. to deny the universality of our human experience. You mentioned the canon. Mm. Of course, there's no rigid ideological standpoint to which something is in or something is out. All yeah. the canon is, is history's bequeathing to us its sense that these books have over, in, in some cases, many centuries yeah. been able to illuminate the depth and complexity of human experience with right. an extraordinary uh, power. And so... Yeah, and it's really important. It's not just academics that determine the canon either. And I'm not saying that the canon isn't open to debate and discussion, that the things don't left out, get left out that should be studied and considered. But it's also artists determine what the canon is, you know, just through the, the influence, just simply through that. You know, there's a reason why Michelangelo matters. And it's because so many artists, because he changed the course of art history. So many artists were uh, borrowed on him and stood on his shoulders. And that's why it matters. It wasn't some academic making a, an arbitrary decision in some ivory tower. That's not how this works. Um, you need to have that awareness. Yeah, well, the 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 evolution. I mean, that, that's why there's an objectivity to these things. You know, yeah. sh sh it, it's it's not simply. Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, the whole the whole idea that Shakespeare is only there because he had a certain powerful stature or whatever is precisely yeah. an expression of the standpoint that there is no underlying truth whatsoever. At, it is. Yeah. What's, what's so, so tragic, tragic about, about the, the, the woke standpoint, standpoint is that it, it denies itself access. access to, to the, the very experiences and books and human, human possibilities that, that would awaken a deeper subjectivity. subjectivity. Right, absolutely. And so it's left with a kind of fragile existential immediacy that's unable to grapple with the complexity or depth of reality. And so it becomes a kind of isolated, fragile island rather than one that can open itself up to the, to the beauty and complexity and difficulty of experience in a more robust and adequate way. And we're already failing. You know, this isn't the case that people are introducing these policies in schools and universities. We are already failing. I think the humanities is probably dead. You know, I think, I think it's already, the rot has already set in. And we are, we are not, precisely what you say, we are not helping people to, people will be unable to experience subjectivity and existence in the way that they should because of these measures that have been, that have been taken. It's like Roger Scruton used to talk about how you couldn't, you, people who don't appreciate classical music, they don't understand what they're missing because they don't, they, it just isn't there for them. So they don't realize that this is a big deal, that, that, that they haven't had the necessary training, uh, you know, and that's, and that's the way I feel about a lot of things. That's why I say I feel like I've been failed by education. I feel like, you know, when I've read enough about certain things, when I've experienced certain things in a way, then I, then I start to realize what I had missed and what I would be missing if I hadn't uh, explored a little more. And, and I, and I feel very sad about that. And, I, and that's why I think it should be a priority. Um, and not to, not to, I mean, it's being, it's being dismissed as elitism, this idea that, that teaching kids Shakespeare, that's a form of elitism because they don't understand it. Well, of course they don't understand it. That's why you teach it, 
to them and then they learn an understanding of it and then they and then ultimately the hope is that they that that informs the way that they see the world and 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 it's the opposite of elitist actually because yeah, of what you're saying the opposite is- of elitist because what you're what you're saying is that this you know poor kid in inner, inner city chicago or whatever she is capable of understanding the depth of human experience in herself right but if, we want to give this you to her that, so she can do that right but if and if you say well that th- this this black child can't understand shakespeare because he's white if you inaugurate that kind of racialized worldview um then then you are doing something deeply damaging to humanity but also particularly to that child you know it's it's not and it's 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 just experientially unsound anyway because we all know that as children when we were left to our own devices we often did empathize and read things that had nothing to do with our own I didn't just read stories about white gay boys. You know, it's not, it's not the way that that, that that worked. So yeah, I think that's something that we need. I mean, in London, there's a school, Catherine Burblesing, you may know, the headmaster, mistress of the Michaela School. I know of her, but I don't, been, I don't know her personally yet. Well, she's been writing an awful lot about this, about how a lot of schools are now teaching, if, if the school is predominantly black, they'll teach the kids Stormzy rather than Shakespeare. They, because they think that a black child can't engage with Shakespeare. It's the bigotry of low expectations. Well, so well, yeah, teaching... it, it's actually racist. It's a profoundly it's racist, racist right. bigoted standpoint. Right, but it's but it's couched in the in the terms of anti-racism. Again, this is the problem. It's the exact opposite of what it claims claims to be. And I think civilizationally, we're not at the high point. Let's be honest. <laughs> we, we, it needs to be this anti-elitist thing where everybody has access to art and more than access to art. I mean, we do that. We you know the art galleries in London are all free. That kind of thing. But do people have the have the means and the education to appreciate what what art is? Do we have? I mean, I can't help but th- I just read um, recently. I read um, uh, uh, Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography. So he's the sculptor, the Florentine sculptor. And <laughs> that's a gold- that's a that's a that's a wild book if ever there was one. He was a oh, it's was, amazing. I oh, know it's he, crazy. That's an adventure story, if anything. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, he killed a bunch of people. He got revenge on the death of his brother. For, the guy who killed his brother, by the way, was acting in self defense. But but Cellini then had this blood rage and had to go and kill. not a nice guy okay so let's just say that but the point <laughs> the point is his account there's a moment in it's it's shortly after it's when he's um when he's making the perseus so you know you, you, the, the 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 bronze statue that's still in the piazza della Signoria in, in yeah of in course Central yes Rome. yeah and yeah yeah i know you know i'm not assuming but it's it's here's a really good example of this actually so when i was younger and i saw that statue i was immediately drawn to it but I didn't really know why. And, and having read more about it and more about art generally of that period, my experience of it is so much more immersive and, 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 uh, and, and stirring, you know? And I think that, that only comes. But the reason I mentioned that book is because there's a moment where he's talking about the unveiling of the Perseus in the square. And the people who gather there across all backgrounds and classes, and uh, they applauded and cheered this, this, this unveiling and were posting sonnets to it sonnets of uh, in, in praise of, of this work of of art there's a kind of discernment there and that's by the way it's not just the posh people this is working class people it's everyone there's a kind of broad cultural discernment there that comes from a healthy culture i'm not saying there weren't problems with that culture <laughs> what i'm saying though is that when it comes to art if we could cultivate that kind of thing again if that i mean it couldn't happen now could it you can't imagine for a start you wouldn't get a statue of that quality being unveiled in central London, would you? I mean, last week we had a a, a, a statue of an ice cream with a fly on it, uh, it being unveiled on the fourth plinth in, in Trafalgar Square. And you don't get people, for a start, the artwork isn't good enough, but you don't get people crowding around and cheering this contribution to our artistic culture. This doesn't happen anymore. I think we've lost something. And I don't want to romanticize the past and say everything was great. I mean, you can't do that if you read Cellini's book because he's such a does such despicable things and these things were normalized you know let's not forget that you know he was only able to write the book because he was under house arrest for uh, sexual misconduct so you know i'm not trying to romanticize it but what i am saying is when it comes to artistic appreciation wouldn't it be amazing if we could reinstill that that sense of awe that comes with great art at a young age into children and not divide them up on the basis of race and saying that your only experience of art and enjoying art is going to be to what extent it reaffirms your existing worldviews. If we could do that, 
then we might have a statue being unveiled in central London and crowds gathering and cheering <laughs> and posting sonnets to it. Who knows? But I just think that's a beautiful ideal if we can reach it. I, I get excited when I hear you speak this way because uh, I profoundly believe that uh, the time, as, as, as bad as things are on Twitter and as <laughs> rancorous as so much of our public discourse is, I profoundly believe that the time is right and ripe for a recovery of a more adequate sense of what human beings are and their relation to what's real. Yes. That precisely the irrationality, the heightened, fevered pitch of the discourse. I mean, when you have the most popular children's author of all time being reviled in this silly Twittersphere for yeah, yeah. essentially as, a, 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 a asserting a, a basic fact of nature, you know that that discourse has become so untethered from the basic terms of human existence that yeah. It's, it's lost its spiritual integrity, its spiritual intellectual integrity. Yeah. You know when that happens, that the standpoint is, is uh, in a kind of writhing, empty last stages. And yeah. so I actually think there's a certain, I, 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 in a certain sense, Titania's popularity is itself a reason for optimism. Because it means yeah. that a lot of people are seeing the contradictions that Titania is pointing out. But what I don't think is that we should be passive relative to our institutional life, educationally, politically, culturally, artistically, et cetera. And that's, that's fundamentally what Ralston College is about. Because yeah. we believe that unless there are institutions uh, with an absolute commitment of freedom of thought, determined to understand the depth and nature of reality, in all of its fullness, that we can't possibly have the forms of culture. I, I get it. I get it. Because what you're saying is, is right, that ultimately it's probably going to have to be private institutions. People, you know, if, if, if the rot has so far set into to the government and, and to the education as it currently stands, it's going to have to be people taking the plunge and setting up. And the reason why it'll work is because people are hungry for it. People are, people are hungry for that educational bedrock. People are hungry to be able to think for themselves and they, and they, they can even, even those who, like myself, who was not educated well, I don't think. Um, and I'm not, I'm not denigrating my teachers. I think that's because of the system. I still knew I was missing something. And I think people do feel they're missing something. And, and that's, yeah. This, yeah. This actually, is how, this, is, this is why I, I've, 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 I'm very optimistic. We get emails almost every day from, from young people, from college students, from young adults and from older adults who are longing for a richer engagement with the questions that 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 their human life raises for them, and what's yeah. amazing is there's 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 never any mention of politics. These are not people who say, "Oh, you should go out there and own the libs," or "You must be uh, you you have to come out there and defend the 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 conservatives" or something like that. Yeah. It's, what's amazing is there's a deep longing springing up for honest asking of real questions, for engagement yeah. with the terms of what we are as human beings, for thinking about it freely, for, for not being subject to the coercions that prevent our asking those questions yes. with the freedom and depth they demand. I think it's, I think it's a fundamental aspect of humanity. I think we, ha we all have it. And that's why there is cause to be optimistic, I think.